Well, uh, welcome everyone. My name is Toshi Hu. I'm the director of the Emerging Media Lab at IFTF, and I'm going to be hosting our foresight talk today with Jake Dunnigan and uh, Jack Barcia. And we're going to um, get started. Let me give us a little context about foresight talks. Um, this is a series that we're producing here at IFTF uh, to help our broader community grow their foresight capabilities and really connect folks and uh, give you a little insight into some of our uh, master practitioners' um, thinking and how they, uh, the activities they're doing and uh, how, how they do what they do. And um, some of the future uh, thinking resources that we're offering uh, beyond this uh, talk series is also the foresight trainings that we offer at IFTF. We've got one coming up in Palo Alto in February, as well as in June of next year, or this year, sorry, we're in 2020 already. Um, we also have uh, a foresight training in Washington, D.C., co-hosted with the World Bank that's happening in March. We have a um, co-hosted training with Steelcase in Munich, Germany, that's in May. Um, and uh, Jake and uh, Jock will be talking today about their Design Futures course, um, which we offered last year for the first time. And we're going to be offering it a number of times. We know right now we're going to be doing it in April. So if you're interested and you like what you hear today, please sign up for that. And uh, we also have launched our online futures thinking course with Coursera. So this is the world's first set of massively open free online futures thinking courses. So take a quick look at that. It's, uh, it's free to sign up for that. And uh, yeah, there's uh, hours and hours of material on there. And it's been uh, very heavily um, traffic and, uh, and appreciate so far. So please check that out. Uh, we also have some upcoming foresight talks. Um, we've got uh, Rachel Alexandra Halsema and, um, from the World Bank, and we're gonna be scheduling that soon. We've got Renee uh, Rohrbeck, a professor at the EDHEC Business School. That's on March 12th. Um, and we also offer some alumni online meetups for those who've already taken our training. I think probably have some uh, folks in the audience today that have uh, gone through our trainings already. And then if you'd like, you can go to our website and also sign up for our Foresight Essential newsletters. And those, those are just low traffic uh, emails and letting, us, letting you guys know what we're up to and opportunities to get involved in the community. Um, today, we're going to have you guys muted on and your videos turned off. We will be able to see uh, Jake and Jacques in a moment. And uh, feel free to introduce yourselves on the chat. Um, and uh, if you want to ask questions, please do it in the Q&A. So if you see there's two icons here, um, use the Q&A window, not the chat. Um, so those are the two icons. So uh, our agenda for today is we're, we're, gonna, we're in the welcome portion. We're going to have a conversation with Jake and Jock. And then we're going to set aside a bunch of time for Q&A with you guys. And you'll be entering that in the Q&A section of your Zoom window. And then we'll have a little bit of a closing. So uh, without further ado, um, I'd like to introduce uh, Jake Dunnigan. He's the director of our Governance Futures Lab at IFTF, uh, amongst other things. And uh, our research affiliate, uh, Jacques Barcia, who's uh, joining us from down in Brazil today. Jake, I believe you're in Austin, Texas. Uh, I'm here in uh, sunny California. And uh, yeah, I'm gonna let you guys introduce yourselves a little bit. So let's uh, show you to stop the screen share so we can actually see, see each other. So Jake, why don't you uh, get, get, uh, give us a little bit of an introduction of yourself. Sure. Good morning, Toshi, and good morning, everybody joining. Uh, very glad to have you share an hour of time uh, to talk about one of my favorite subjects, which is design and experiential futures. As Toshi men mentioned, I lead the governance design lab uh, at the Institute for the Future, where we're trying to invent and reinvent government to, to, to serve the purpose of people and the environment in the future, now and in the future. So um, social inventors as a term is very important to me and, and seeing myself and others as social inventors uh, is, is critical to my work and goals uh, in my work. Uh, I also do, as uh, you might guess, I do a lot of experiential futures um, uh, and design futures. So I teach uh, experiential futures at the California College of Arts and UT Austin and our course uh, at IFTF that we just launched in December, which we'll discuss a little bit more. So um, governance design, experiential futures, and then also the last big pillar of what I do is neuropolitics. So looking at how our understanding of the mind and brain, uh, how we manipulate it, uh, how it is manipulated, uh, changes our political system and our social dynamics and power dynamics. So those things are kind of the pillars. I, of course, work with uh, lots of other things, uh, companies, large companies, uh, 
across different industries, governments. I've been doing a lot of work with the U.S. Conference of Mayors in the last couple of years, so that's been very exciting. Uh, has rekindled my fading hope in our political uh, endeavors in the future. So there's there's good things happening uh, at certain levels if you know where to look. Um, so I'm very glad to join you. And um, beyond this call, beyond this webinar, uh, please feel free to reach out anytime. Um, I love to hear from people working and and swimming in similar waters. Thanks, Jake. Jack, tell us a little bit about yourself and your background and your work with IFTF. Cool, awesome. Uh, good morning all, and good morning to a couple of Brazilians that I saw are in this, um, this webinar. Uh, so yeah, I'm Jack Barcia. I'm a research fellow at the Institute for the Future. I wear many hats. Uh, I do so many things, uh, but at IFTF, I'm involved in the Vantage program doing research, or I was uh, involved in last year's uh, Future 50 research on the futures of power, the, the distributed superpowers. Um, this year, I'll be involved as well, uh, researching uh, beyond organizations. Um, I also teach uh, in the Design Futures training, um, and I'm doing some research for a, a client here in Brazil. We have uh, Sanai, the, the Brazilians um, in the webinar will recognize this name. Sanai is a big uh, association of uh, manufacturing industries, and we're helping them uh, build their own foresight capacity. Uh, but I've, I was involved in innovation and design uh, and in media. Um, I'm a uh, weird fiction author or a genre fiction author. Some <laughs> stories published in the, in the U.S. and the U.K. Uh, I've worked with um, um, technology, technology Park here in, in Recife, where I'm based in northeast Brazil, called Porto Digital, and also the CESA, which is a major innovation uh, institute uh, also uh, based in here in Recife where I taught uh, design futures in their uh, design program both in the undergraduate and the graduate um, program so yeah so um, design futures experiential scenarios prototype in the future I'm, I'm really interested in uh, and that's one of the topics of our design futures training is to help um, uh, Foresight practitioners use design to em embody the future and feel the future, uh, use narratives and experiences to make people engage with the future in, in more emotional ways, but also helping uh, designers and innovators to design for the future, future or with the future in mind or inside the future uh, using foresight. So that's, that's some of the things that I'm involved with and, and some of my interests. Fantastic. Yeah, so let's uh, get started and just kind of dive in. I know in a minute we're going to talk specifically about the course that, that was just offered and we're about to offer again, but let's get do a little more background. I think, uh, Jacques, you just gave a really great definition of, of, of design futures and experiential futures, but uh, Jake, could you kind of expand that on that a little bit and talk a little bit about what the motivation and impetus for creating this as our second course offering at IFTF? I think oh, you're having too. audio issues. Let's see. Uh, can we unmute you? I will. I, I just. Let's see. There we go. Can you hear me? Oh, yes, we can. Sorry. Okay. So I muted myself go. and then realized that I don't have the power to unmute. So that's fun. There's a there's a design feature. Um, yeah. So design features. I mean, I'll, I'll I'll try to give the the most pithy uh, version of it. It really comes out of the idea that. Uh, we want to have an impact on the world. We want future, the future and futures to make a difference in the world in the present and help people use that information or use that knowledge or use those insights to make better decisions. Uh, the f field of futures has been around uh, probably in its sort of consistent iteration since after World War II. And I think it's not a coincidence that it came after a period when we could potentially destroy the planet. So foresight itself, I think, is rising because of the existential threats that we have created for ourselves um, and it's a response to that but uh, over you know over the last 60 70 80 years of, of, of development really good foresight doesn't hasn't helped us make <laughs> great decisions maybe we avoided a nuclear war I don't know um, we, we don't we can't do counterfactual histories but we feel like and I think it's pretty obvious that we're not living in one of the better scenarios that we could have imagined 50 years ago I think uh, inequality, environmental destruction, uh, 
you know, global political strife, all of those things uh, are happening. And, and so we asked the question, why aren't we getting the outcomes that we can imagine? And so one of our responses is that people have a really, an amazing ability to dismiss uh, both as individuals and as societies, futures uh, and, and possibilities that they don't like either to themselves or to their organizations. You know, they want to, they want to maintain power. They want to uh, have a, or we have competing versions of the future. Uh, Ashish Nandi, you know, says that um, basically uh, it's it, the, the foresight and futures is a game of dis dissenting visions, right? So we have, we have these things. We have a lot of great ideas. Um, we're not really organized very well. And this is all a big wind up to say, why we do design and experiential futures, because we feel like if we can help people experience a possible future, to feel it, to touch it maybe, even a simulation of that, that they will hopefully, and I think there's, there's some good science backing it now, that they will make better decisions for themselves. Um, one, one piece of research or, or a host of research that we've been looking at is how uh, when people think about themselves in the future, they... Uh, their brain patterns mirror as if they're thinking about a stranger, right? So why would I put away money uh, in savings for somebody that feels like not me, right? Um, I, I think uh, looking at how we uh, uh, do something called affective forecasting, trying to predict our own happiness in the future. Um, Dan Gilbert wrote a, a great book and, and do, has done research showing that we're really bad at that. So we're uncovering some of these biases and limitations we have. And we feel like if we can bridge that gap, as my uh, friend and colleague Stuart Candy, who I do a lot of work with, says, if we can bridge the, the experiential gap between the lived present, the thing that we can feel now, and an abstract future uh, or possible sets of futures, that we can act more appropriately to get the outcomes we want, that we feel it, that we understand it more deeply. And so we're trying to create a host of uh, tools, techniques, concepts, theories, practices that help bridge between the lived present and a set of possible futures. One of our other kind of takeaway notes is that uh, ultimately it's better to be surprised by a simulation or a scenario rather than blindsided by reality. So we're trying to learn as, as all you know, human societies are trying to learn and get better, I hope. Um, that learning doesn't have to be the hard way every time. It doesn't have to be painful, violent, expensive. We're trying to pre-experience or, or design pre-experiences so that we can learn and steer clear early and also to avoid some of the more negative and painful outcomes. So that's the kind of the big picture. And you know, we can talk about the actual theories and techniques and practices and ways that we accomplish that. But that's really the goal is to try to, is to, to pre-experience possible futures so that we can steer and design our way toward better ones. You're muted, Toshi. I can Thank control you. my mute. I'm yeah. back. Um, <laughs> um, let's talk about the practice, let's dive in. So. Um, Let's talk a little bit about what is the practice of experiential futures, uh, design futures, um, and what are the kind of outputs of this, um, and what are the intentions and philosophy around that, and, 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 and how did you decide essentially to what to include in this course um, versus what, what, you know, how to prioritize what was in this course, given that it's a two-day course? Jacques, you want to tackle that? Yeah, and you're um, muted too. Let's see. We're in this fun whack -a, whack a mute. There you go. Um, I think. Well, Jake, uh, you've been you've been doing this for for a longer time. I, I think you should. So, which while well, you'll have a fresher answer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think we um, we kind of decided. So um, at IFTF. Um, so okay, uh, Jake and I and I have to have been have been doing this um, what we call now design futures for some time now but we haven't codified this into a single uh, a single practice and I think uh, we both or the three of us I have to have as an institution felt the necessity to kind of uh, have that structured in a way of thinking and, and doing uh, it this particular type of futures practice. And it's, it's really uh, timely because uh, design futures, this, this term as, as, as we kind of, we've, as, as we've been saying this, this term design futures is kind of a, a broad umbrella term for many uh, different types of practices that combine design and foresight or 
use foresight to boost design or use design to boost foresight. Uh, so IFTF has been doing um, artifacts from the future for a long time. Uh, Jason Tester has been the, uh, I mean, the, the, the one that, I think that uh, he's the one that began this practice within IFTF. Then Jake and, and Stuart Candy have been toying with uh, how to bridge that experiential gap. And here in Brazil, uh, since we, uh, we don't have a, um, how can I say, we don't have a history uh, or a, um, a solid history of foresight. We've kind, kind of been trying to experiment with, um, with different uh, ways of doing foresight and um, making people experience uh, the future has been one, one very interesting tool. So we kind of decided to um, make a, uh, a framework out of that or try to organize these, uh, these methods and tools and offer that to the public. And I, I can give it even simpler, like, well, to the, to the point about media, Toshi, which is part of their question too, I can, I can follow up on what Jacques was saying is, you know, so right, written word scenarios is typically, or one way, or not even science fiction to a degree, uh, is a way that we experience futures. And that's great, right? We can use our imagination, we can do all that. But we, uh, we really take the tangibility part seriously. So physical artifacts. You know, a, a, a pack of cancer scrubbing nanoparticle cigarettes, right? Um, uh, even videos are a little bit more immersive. And of course, you've been working in VR and that kind of immersive experience. But games, um, artifacts from the future, uh, uh, videos, performance, uh, projection media, all of these things now, I think, are, are considered part of our toolkit and part of the ways that we do that bridging part. I mean, just to bring up a quick example, we were talking earlier, we met a, um, the former vice minister of the environment in Brazil, um, who's now uh, not part of the current administration. Uh, and he was saying, you know, that the, 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 the environmental destruction in Brazil is worse than you can imagine, right? And uh, our Sarah Skowerski, on, on, we were talking earlier, she was saying, yeah, the people in Northern California, you know, are talking about last year's fires or the people in Australia, the fires are worse than you can imagine. So all these people are saying, you know, are trying to do this, this, this bridging act activity to say, if you really could feel it, it would be incredibly powerful to you and maybe it would make you act more uh, on these issues than you would have before. So that is, that's what everything is, experience design. It's all to try to help us imagine better uh, or feel better what's happening now. So those are the things that are happening now and it's still difficult. So imagine a, a, a possible future that we're doing. So all of these techniques is very, very tactical in a sense, right? So we're, we're just trying to connect. We're just trying to overcome those biases that I briefly mentioned before, those neurological biases. We're trying to have an emotional connection. Um, you know, you cannot, I don't think, you cannot act appropriately to the future if you don't have an emotional core. And, it's, and, a, and those are types of the values that you want to see. So seeing the world and feeling the world that might exist or possible, several possible worlds that might exist uh, help overcome some of those cognitive biases we might have. Again, just I, and I, I might say this 10 more times because it's so important. It's really to make it, people have a more appropriate response and a better um, set of decision-making tools to think about the future more effectively and so that we get better outcomes. And that's what, it's, that's what all of this is about. And games, videos, posters, artifacts, experiences, all of that is in service of that. Uh, as a colleague said, that's not the work. Those things are fun and we talk about them. We'll show it. Great for show and tell. But the work is when minds are changed and decisions are changed and better outcomes are made. Yeah, and I think yeah. it all comes to create meaning, which uh, that's what uh, art does or design does. It's create meaning out of, uh, out of information. So when we talk about the future and we do scenarios, uh, it's all very rational. Uh, but when we add uh, characters or we add a piece of art, we add a poster, uh, then you have, then you help people create meaning. Um, and you, when you embody the future, when you immerse people inside, uh, into the future, uh, it helps them create meaning, subjective meaning. Yeah. We talk a lot of, of course, about like the differences about the, between telling stories about uh, t talking about the future with statistics versus talking about the future with stories. Right. And it's the stories that make those human connections uh, in ways that not only help us relate, but imagine ourselves in these futures. I think right now we can see this with kind of the climate emergency, right? We can hear about the percentage chance that we're going to have increased temperatures and wildfires, and then we can see people in Australia 
like running or in, with the red sky around them. Those are, those are stories versus statistics. And we need uh, I want to remind, just, just, we, we, we need both, yeah, right? We need, we need that rigor. I mean, this is, uh, some people go more into the, the quantitative realm and, and, and data. That's part of our reality. We need it, but we also need the storytelling. So we're not storytellers unhinged from reality. We have a basis in fact, but we do this kind of projection or speculation into the future, but it's anchored in reality. So it's not, pure art or pure science fiction it's a, a distinguishing factor i want to make yeah i want to invite uh, remind everybody in the audience to keep, uh, submit some questions in a couple minutes we're going to switch over to the q a discussion portion so if you've got questions in mind um but i'm already seeing a couple in the chat and one of them is really i think when it comes down to it we can kind of talk about this conceptually but i think people want to hear all right give us some examples what is an artifact tell us about like what, what how do you create a, a futures game could you share some of your favorite examples that you think best kind of explain um, the impact of this work? Yeah, I ha I'll, if Jacques, if you don't mind, I have a couple uh, ready in my hands, as a matter of fact. Cool. <laughs> uh, and then we can, <laughs> so yeah, the physicality of this, I wanted to embody that as well. Um, we, Stuart and I uh, started doing experiential features, design features in Hawaii in the mid 2000s, 2006, 2007. Um, again, not to get too academic and historical, but there was, there's a whole history of work before that. Uh, Wendy Schultz, uh, we were inspired by her talking about ambient foresight, Jason Tester doing artifacts, you know, um, world building coming out of science fiction and, and minority report, of course, to get, get a bingo point for that. Um, so there was stuff before, but for us, uh, working in Hawaii, so I'm going to give a, a couple of, or at least one example from Hawaii. And this was a, a, a project we did for, Tourism Management Institute at the University of Hawaii. And we ran a quick workshop. Um, and so, you know, we, we couldn't do a full immersive experience with actors and sets and things that we had actually done before um, for a previous project, but we could create something uh, very simple, but very powerful. And so an example as a postcard from the future. And we created four different postcards. I think I only have three with me uh, from alternative futures for Hawaii. And we use the alternative futures from Jim Dater uh, taught there. We won't have to go into that uh, methodology, but there's, again, a, a sort of methodological background to all of this. So we created four alternative futures of Hawaii embodied in postcards, a very um, quintessential Hawaiian artifact, a tourist-related artifact. And so it can be as simple as that. So here's one that's a, a collapse story. So this was, uh, I think, 07 we did these. And, you know, this is obviously before Haiti in 2010 and... Puerto Rico a couple of years ago. So the idea was that there was a, a, a massive hurricane in Hawaii and the U.S. kind of left it to its own, which was very provocative and people were very skeptical of that. But again, we've seen that happen. So instead of a typical postcard, hey, I'm in Hawaii, this is a call to the U.N. Secretary General um, of the time, please help us, basically. So this is a, a call for help. We had a different future that was uh, Maui Hatton. So this is the idea that... Uh, growth story has accelerated and there's casinos and all of these things are happening in Hawaii. So it's really accelerated into this sort of playground for the rich and little subtleties like the East West Maui bridge because sea level rise has split the Island of Maui, things like that, you know, are, are, are details. And then another one, which is kind of a virtual world, but it's owned by this company. So you could only experience this virtual world. They, they own the IP to all of the kind of blue Hawaii, 1960s Elvis version of Hawaii. And so this is kind of a, an advertisement for that. So it was a, a, a quick example that I had at hand uh, of, of as simple as it gets, right? A very simple artifact, um, you know, it could be a drawing. So it scales to, to you know, as high a scale as you want. So from something simple like that to fully immersive lived experiences, which we've, you know, created in, in the past as well, where you have where you come into a room and you're, you're, you're cast in a sort of role and you play along and there's, you know, um, uh, there's, there's all the set uh, uh, pieces and props and things that are all coordinated in that way. So it scales from, can be very simple to very complex and videos too. I consider those artifacts as well. So we've created future videos. Uh, we use genre conventions like advertising and new employee hires and all of those things are, are, are ways that we surf and bridge between uh, a kind of genre that people understand, but content that's that potentially is very provocative, right? So we we're always we're always modulating the distance and the cognitive load for people that experience this, so that it's not you know sometimes you have to cut corners or sometimes you have to you have to give people a little bit of a handrail to get to where you're going. So we we think about these things very 
very deeply the audience experience and what can they actually, what's thinkable for them and what's too much and, and, and maybe what's a, you know, a, an advertising genre that, that they might understand or, you know, a convention, uh, a genre convention or something that we can utilize to help make, get our message across. Uh, so those are, those are some of the, the ways that we think about the, the design and it's, it's a very holistic systems way of thinking through. There's many different levels of fidelity and complexity right. that can be created from a postcard to an entire world. Right. Speaking of um, uh, provocative, Jacques, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about your funeral experience that you created. Yeah, yeah. so I, I have, well, anyway, I have some slides where I, I can talk a little bit about it more uh, deeply, but anyway, um, so a couple of years ago, like two years ago, we did a an experiential scenario for a, an association of funeral services. So these guys, they uh, they they wanted uh, our help because they were worried about the death of death. So they they saw things you know, about you know um, uh, about longevity. It. Yeah, they worried about yeah they you know funeral services. If right. nobody dies, then <laughs> well. Um, but yeah, so so they they saw some things about ultra longevity and you know um, people living like two hundred years or even forever. So they reached out to um, so we could help them understand this death of death. So, but but then we reframed the question uh, and we understood that they actually they were worried about the death of rituals of death. So uh, people were not going to funerals or uh, the the um, you know. Um, a funeral or, or, or longing uh, was being transformed by social media and, um, and even artificial intelligence and deep fakes. So we had to uh, communicate that to a number of stakeholders because it, it, it's an association of funeral services. So they had like hundreds of people uh, involved in the association and we couldn't just you know, do a report and do a workshop with so many people. So we decided to prototype a funeral in 2035. So uh, we went to uh, into a hotel and we um, we prototyped or we do we set a scene in which uh, in which there was a funeral, but it was not a traditional funeral. Actually, uh, what we thought was, what if um, blockchain and artificial intelligence, deep fakes, voice interfaces could simulate a, a someone. Uh, after they die. So if we could recover their memories and their experiences uh, and we, we could simulate that persona, what were the implications for, uh, for families, for, um, for businesses, for example. So we did uh, a funeral in which the deceased person was actually addressing the crowd. And we did this without telling anyone that it was actually staged. Now, it was important because uh, this particular industry is not very connected to technology. So the surprise effect was really important, but we didn't try to lure them into believing that it was actually real. Uh, we kind of gave hints that, okay, maybe this is a little too much, but we kind of built a, 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 a scene so immersive that they suspended their disbelief. That's one term that we use, for example, in literature, particularly in science fiction. You have to uh, give enough uh, context so people suspend their disbelief. They stop not believing. Actually, they, they know it's not real, but they say, "Okay, I'll I'll let you, uh, you know, um, uh, I'll let you guide me through this fiction." And it was a really interesting experience. We did that for it was a forty-minute um, play with ten actors for a crowd of one hundred and twenty people. And the, the curious thing was that when we kind of, we ended up and lift the, uh, the curtain and said, okay, this, this is not real. Actually, this is an experiential scenario. Uh, we want to, to discuss what are the possibilities of these technologies and the implications of, of, of these, these types of things and these disruptions if they come true. And a couple of people said uh, they, they, were not, they were not disbelieving anymore. They, they were kind of they were so immersed that they, uh, that they um, confronted us and said, no, 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 this, 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 this can't be not real. This cannot be unreal. This should be real. So it was a really interesting experience. Fantastic. I love hearing about that, Jacques. 
Um, if people if people are ever in the Palo Alto area and want to come by IFTF, we have a whole collection of, um, uh, of uh, artifacts of the future scattered throughout. And we always recommend you even go into our bathroom. There's even some in the bathrooms. And if you want to come downstairs to the Emerging Media Lab, we actually have something called um, Simtainer, which is a virtual reality storytelling platform for IFTF to actually create virtual reality experiences that allow people to step into futures. Um, we have uh, experience where you uh, are able to step into the future of basically micro uh, shipping containers, micro homes, um, micro uh, farms and micro clinics and the idea of kind of the future where we need to have modular architecture, um, but you're actually able to embodiedly step into these places. Um, I want to switch over to questions and answers because we really want to get, um, turn this into a conversation. Um, I'm seeing a couple of questions here, both from Jeremy and from Luis, that are kind of classic questions uh, for us at IFTF, really, which are about how do you kind of, how do you make the case for the real impact and outcome for creating experiential futures? Um, you know, they might seem very fun and whimsical and very provocative, but how do you make the connection for um, clients and partners around the value in creating these in terms of creating actual impact outcome um, and initiatives that people can act on. Yeah, um, you know, on, on that point, I think we're we're seeing the growth of this. We've been talking, of course, naturally it's about some of our own experiences and examples, but you're seeing this kind of work pop up in places like Dubai with the Museum of the Future. So they uh, six years ago started to design uh, a Museum of the Future of Government Services. That's where it began at the World Government Summit. Uh, it was kind of a traveling exhibition or a, a temporary exhibition. And they used that as inspiration for several immediate uh, initiatives. So, you know, fanciful things like drone delivery of driver's license and things like that, but also just the, the user experience of, of bettering government service interfaces for them. So healthcare interfaces, uh, housing, all of those things have, have, have come in uh, and, and, and been implemented. Another one from my experience now going back uh, a while is in Hawaii, we did a, a, a kind of street version uh, on the streets of Chinatown and Honolulu, uh, three different possible futures of Chinatown. And one of those was a disease outbreak. So a, a kind of pandemic flu uh, happened and uh, Chinatown had to respond. It was kind of ground zero for that. Uh, of course, Hawaii had experience or had the after effects of SARS. Um, you know, we've had these things almost hit several times. And so we created that uh, that experience as if it happened last year so that we didn't, you know, that we're not scaring people, uh, as it were. We have to be careful about that, obviously. Um, and the CDC and the Hawaii Department of Public Health really got excited about that and said, okay, this is a way for people to learn. We've been trying to tell people through public service announcements and everything else, and, and you, you've been able to get people's attention in a way that we haven't before. And so <clears throat> uh, we ran a alternate reality game a year later on a kind of pig swine, swine flu outbreak. Um, there's, there's, I could talk about this for, or for the next hour plus of this, but the thing that happened as we were about to launch was the, if you remember in 09, there was a swine flu outbreak in Mexico and it actually happened. So we were creating, we created a system, uh, a, a game, an alternate reality game that, be, that we changed into an emerging reality game. And it became, okay, you know, from a what if to, all right, now what do you need to do? Um, I mean, things that we take for granted now, like sneezing into your elbow instead of your hands came out of that. That's really when it kind of took off at that point. Um, and so, um, you know, it can be very practical. It can be provocative. You knew, you need to think about these different futures. You're not, you're not seeing it coming. You know, you're, you're a, a higher education institution. You really need to see how people might be learning in the future, or it can be, it can be very practical and, and saying, okay, if something like this happens, it's kind of a simulation or a disaster simulation you see quite a bit. That's not all we do, but, um, so it, it, it scans across that. And I think for say a company, uh, they're seeing the value, uh, you know, again, going back to that term blindsided, I think sort of government agencies, other organizations, but companies have been blindsided and, and gone out of business. And, you know, we can, we can talk about the trail of dead of companies that didn't, that didn't act on uh, uh, a changing industry. And so uh, getting buy-in, having that experience, overcoming some of those biases, uh, we're beginning to see organizations incorporate these things into the, again, a whole, a whole system of, of communication and research and 
stats and all of that. Um, but also these kind of lived provocations so that uh, it can be a shorthand for people to talk about that, but it can also motivate action. And so uh, uh, again, so government cases um, sort of in the public, public health examples um, and in companies, which was kind of the, the lagging one because I think the return on investment wasn't as clear in many cases, that feedback loop. Oh yeah, you provoked this, but how did that change our behavior? And we're beginning to see that companies are, are investing in this because it has that, I mean, they realize that, that, that change has to happen through psychology and culture as well. And this is an, an, an aid, not only to deliver information, but to deliver a, a kind of movement that can happen even within organizations. And also, I think um, there's the, the, the other side. I mean, uh, design futures is about engagement. That's what Jake just said. Uh, but also, you can use design futures and, and artifacts from the future and experiential, experiential scenarios to kind of prototype the future uh, and think about new offerings, new be them products, services, public policies, and test them uh, in a limited way, of course. I mean, uh, a prototype, there are several levels of prototyping. Um, a scribble in a paper can be a prototype, but also a more... Um, structured and more tangible, uh, um, you know, piece of electronics can also be a prototype. So we can prototype these new offerings, these public policies or or um, or, or products, and with them in our literally in our hands, we can think, okay, what are uh, what what new business model does this artifact enables, or or what must change in order for this to exist in a positive or in, or in a negative way. So uh, it helps innovation. Hmm. Yeah, we talked at uh, IFTF around. To speak for the, the product and service side, Jacques, I, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it, it's a very important part of this too, is to, is to inspire and uh, evoke new kinds of offerings and services, for sure. At IFTF, we talk about uh, foresight as a cycle where we're doing you know, our prepare cycle, our foresight cycle, our insight cycle, and then our action cycle. And that's really often where the process of translating this. Uh, and I know in the course, that's something that you guys uh, touch upon on day two, because I get a chance to sit in on that. I want to make sure we get to some other questions here. There's some really uh, great ones here. Um, some of them are a little bit more kind of generalized around just foresight process. Um, uh, but let's talk about them within kind of the experiential features uh, domain. Um, we're getting some questions around kind of ethics and bias um, from Sergio and um, Sheila here around how we're, uh, what, what, how do we um, kind of check ourselves in terms of bias on like our decisions in creating these experiential features? Um, and are there other ethical considerations when we're doing this kind of work? Maybe you want to start this round, Jacques. Okay, so um, one of the specific things that we wanted to address in our, uh, not just the training, but in our take on design futures is to use uh, foresight, combine foresight and design to help uh, ourselves and our clients understand the biases and assumptions in, uh, in, in futures design. So if we're trying to, again, if we're, uh, developing a new product or service and we think that this uh, answers to some uh, some problem in society, then we can use design features to kind of um, dive into those assumptions and those biases and say, okay, who, uh, who to whom does this, um, this product or service or uh, the, the orientation of this new offering, uh, who does this, does it benefit? Or um, am I, do I have some bias uh, or towards it or against it? So we can kind of use, and we, we kind of, we specifically developed a one tool, one or two tools to kind of help people address this. Yeah. And, Jake, uh, and yeah. let me just add one thing that from the other questions too, is how can we also integrate kind of the collective process and democratizing this to also address kind of bias and ethics issues? Right. Yeah. So let me, let me, let me give a brief answer to the first part, um, just some reflections on that, and then we can talk about the um, the participatory part of, side of this thing. But I mentioned uh, the the uh, pandemic flu outbreak as one of the scenarios we did on on the ground in Hawaii and, and Chinatown. The first one we did was actually a gentrification story, and we had gone around for months. Um, my wife's an artist. Um, you know, we we live and work in that area quite a bit, and so I I 
we did some formal and informal uh, investigations and historical and um, uh, lookbacks as well. But if you ask a lot of people around Chinatown, uh, you know, if, if a Starbucks came in on this an empty, empty building or if these, you know, chain stores came in, how would you feel about that? Or, or you know, it's becoming different. It's becoming gentrified. And you heard, we heard that over and over again. So we basically gave people back that future. We, we put up signage, you know, luxury lofts are coming, uh, you know, $2 million opening bid, and uh, which was you know, all of a sudden doesn't sound like that very much, but it was a lot at the time. Um, and TGI Fridays is moving in and American Apparel and all these things. So we, we gave people back their assumptions or at least their fears. Uh, and when we did that and they thought it was real for, you know, even it was only really a, a few hours on a first Friday uh, art walk. The same people were, would tell us, oh, yeah, well, okay, um, you know, that building's been empty. That might drive foot traffic to my gallery or, you know, that, that might improve this block of apartments that have been empty or that have been decrepit for a long time. So there's a lot of, lot of you know, assumptions baked into that. But the, the takeaway point for me was that when people actually believed it, even for a short period of time, their answers were different than when they just sort of, you know, sort of guessed or speculated about what they would want or not want in the future. And so I, I come out of anthropology as uh, my discipline background. And I know, you know, from anthropological research uh, uh, that people don't tell you what they actually do. <laughs> you know, if you ask them to self-report, it's probably not going to be very accurate. Similar for the future, I think, is that people assume that they're going to feel a certain way about the future. But when you give it to them and they actually believe it, they, feel, they might feel a different way, or at least they, they're able to interrogate those assumptions a little more deeply. Now, there are huge ethical uh, uh, considerations in that. You know, do, yeah. We weren't trying to fool people just to fool them, to make them feel yeah. dumb or to, to, you know, to do that. We're, it was a functional uh, attempt to try to ease them into con reconsidering their, their baseline assumptions. And this was before disinformation exploded yeah, and fake exactly. news. So I'm a, a lot more hesitant about um, something we call don't break the universe where we, we just act as if this is happening. Um, there, there were previous co uh, considerations already, but now that we have this world of, of people weaponizing fake news and disinformation and hoax, uh, you know, um, it, 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 it really carries a different, a different set of considerations and criteria to overcome when we do those kind of things. Now back to the collective question, you have to be very strategic. There are points where, uh, you know, where do you want, I think, I think for a lot of us, we default to more is better, like getting more inputs is better uh, at certain, and it, I think it's, it is important, but you have to figure out where the stage you want that. So for example, in the Chinatown project, we heard from hundreds of people. We, would, we do surveys, we do uh, ethnographic work, we do historical work, and we get a lot of input into that part. The scenario writing and some of the creation of the actual scene or the, the, the situation that you're creating, um, I find that if you have too many cooks, it gets, it gets messy. So there is a, there is a, a kind of con convergence in a, in a smaller group uh, that, that, that has to do that kind of creative work. Then you can, uh, you can also, also engage a lot more people to create the stuff, you know, the, the artifacts or the experiences. So there's a point there where people can come in again and then your audience, right? So depending on your project, you can engage thousands or, or hundreds or thousands or 10,000 people into that experience. I mean, movies do that, right? It's a, it's, there's a, you know, a dynamic to that. So it's not, it's not all or better or more participation is good. It's, it's, it's right timing and right sizing that. Where is the input most important? Um, where is it going to be most useful? Because you do need that diversity of voices. You don't want to just recapitulate your, your own assumptions too. So we're always going back and challenging that. So we do workshops, we do ethnographic research, we do historical research, surveys, all these things, um, and then creative exercises to help us as best we can, nothing's ever going to be perfect, but to try to try to make sure that we're um, not colonizing the future with our own assumptions. Yeah. And, and depending on the audience and depending on the project, you might want to use different um, design futures approaches. So for some, just one artifact or a bunch of art, artifacts in, in, in a table or in a gallery where people can, uh, you know, look at them and discuss them is enough. But sometimes you need to, interact with people or you have you, you need to address um you know a longer story uh for a larger audience so you might want to do a play or you want to involve them or you want to use a game that really depends on on the project and the audience mm -hmm. that's great i think we have uh, time for one more question i had one from an anonymous attendee here that's quite interesting i think um 
They write, what is, is or is there criteria for design features that separate it from art and other experiential learning practices? Mm-hmm. And I'll, I'm going to add to that as well, like just kind of making some contrasting distinctions. Think, uh, what are you know, your thoughts around kind of design features versus design thinking? Mm-hmm. Right. A lot of I think there's a lot of relationships there and there's some oh, some overlap but there's some differences. So could you kind of distinguish design features from design thinking, experiential learning practices, and just art in general? Mm-hmm. How is it different? Mm-hmm. Yeah, go ahead, John. So, um, so art, the, be that uh, fiction, um, painting, video, and what we do with in design futures, the difference is that we are uh, we're using media or medium, media in general, to... Uh, communicate uh, research. We, we're using media to communicate data. Uh, art doesn't art doesn't have to um, doesn't have to be based on anything. It just it's an, it's an expression of the artist, uh, the sensibilities of the artist. In design futures, we actually research. We gather data. We talk to people. We do scenarios. We 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 do rigorous research and use. Uh, the media, be that fiction or art or video or play, to communicate or engage audiences with that. So that's, that's basically the difference. Mm-hmm. Now, design thinking, uh, I'm, I'm a little critical of design thinking, um, being a, uh, a master's in design and um, it, have studied in a school which really uh, connects with design thinking. Now, design thinking is a one specific... Uh, way of thinking of design actually is a it, the uh, it's it's a box of tools from one particular school of thought and one and actually one p- particular uh, design consultancy that uh, tries to um, make design simpler for the larger audience uh, make it accessible to the larger audience but it's not design thinking is not um, it's not design itself. Uh, it's a tool. It's, it's more like a tool. Uh, th- the same way that futures thinking in general is a tool. But then you go to foresight. The practice itself is, is deeper. It has you know more. It has theory. It has methods. It has a history. Uh, design has methods and history and, and theories. And design thinking is is one way of making it easier for non designers or or people in general to try to think as a designer, which means think about not solutions, but think of problems, think of, uh, of people instead of things, think of context instead of, uh, of an answer, for example. So, Jake, yeah, yeah um, uh, being uh, partnered to an artist, uh, and uh, sensitive to what art is, that's already a hard question. So how is it different from art? It'd be hard to define. So I know a lot of artists that do deep research and spend 90% of their time doing that kind of background stuff. So just for, for myself, I know we're, we're generalizing, right? But I think it's really about outcomes and, 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 and where that focus is. So again, for us, the work, the, the, the artifacts and the experiences are, to me, invitations for the next thing, which is the thing which is uh, deeper conversations about the future, interrogating your own assumptions, um, potentially changing minds, uh, changing policy outcomes, changing corporate uh, strategy It's in some cases. Um, so, uh, you know, the idea of public foresight, art, art, art can make a difference too, right? I mean, we, we can name dozens of examples of, of ways that our minds have been changed by an experience of art. Um, and I know a lot of artists are, are intending for that, but I think for us, it's a lot, it's more structured in that sense than art is. We are, and, and more formalized to try to get those outcomes. So the Chinatown project, which I mentioned a few times, and all of our work will often have a workshop or a platform for conversation that comes, that, that's embedded in that. So if there's a, an experience or, or you know, a, a piece of thing, something that looks kind of like art or, or design, that is really to serve a, a better conversation and to serve the outcome, c- certain kinds of outcomes. So that's, to me, it's a, it's a, it's a, it, we use those tools um, and often artists are trying to have a certain kind of outcome too, but I think it's the, the amplitude of those inflections is that for us, it's really about getting better at long-term thinking and uh, empowering people to make better decisions. And so the, the art and all of that stuff that, that is really fun to talk about and it's great for show and tell. Yeah. Again, 
service of that second part. Yeah. So when I, when I write a story, I do a lot of research, right? But, but I can't distort, bend that, that research uh, to benefit the story itself. Uh, when I do scenarios or when I do experiential scenarios or, or an artifact from the future, I do lots of research, but I cannot bend the rules that much. I cannot bend the data. I cannot bend, I can work on top of it to think of alternative futures, of implications, et cetera, obviously, but I can't distort the, the data or the facts. Uh, so I think that's, it connects to what you said about the outcome, but also I think that in the process, in the intention, the intent of, of art and design futures and artifact or et cetera are really different. It's not that different in uh, uh, speculative design, for example, which is one of, the, of the, the practices within design futures, which is more connected to art, critical art or critical design. Uh, it, it has more of this... Um, artful way of of producing artifacts and, and media, but but again, I think there are, there's a difference in intent and constraints, as you mentioned. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. In this one, we're, we're more constrained. Yeah. We can't cheat um, students. You can't just yeah. make up stuff. <laughs> yeah. All right. So uh, there's so many great questions in the stream, and in a minute, and when we wrap up, we're going to put um, every uh, all of our emails um, in the uh, on the screen, and you, you should be getting that in a follow-up email if you signed up for this webinar. Uh, we encourage you to kind of keep reaching out to us and continue the conversation. Um, I, I think a, a big part of this is about us connecting with you guys, um, and uh, just continue to figure out exactly what all these uh, new territories are. I think one of my favorite slides from the course, guys, that you have, uh, the Design Futures course, is this kind of new mapping of terminology and territories of like innovation, design thinking, and futures thinking, and experiential art. And you kind of kind of have this like multi-dimensional Venn diagram that is very much kind of emerging, right? And these terms are emerging, these territories are overlapping. and um, Some of them are conceptual and are just being kind of developed, and some are like implemented more um, systematically at this point. So I think it's yeah. highly emerging, which leads us to our actually I last question. I want to give a shout out to uh, Elliot oh, Montgomery <laughs> for doing that slide oh, yeah. and, and laying out that first map. So if you want to look, look it up, uh, Google Elliot Montgomery at the New School, and he has a, a map of these different genres and subgenres from design futures and speculative design and art and foresight. Any other key words they could search on? There you think. I'll have to, have to look it up, but we can. Right, we'll, we'll send it out in the fall. Yeah, Elliot Montgomery. Um, but let's add, on, and this is, we'll have to do a quick response because we just have five minutes left. But um, Jeremy Nilick also asked the question, I think this is a great one, uh, for a futurist to, ask, to be asked, what is the future of experiential futures? Is there a growth scenario for design futures? Uh, what do you guys see as kind of the short and longer term future for experiential futures? Yeah, um, you know, it's growing. I mentioned the, the, the Museum of the Future in Dubai. Um, you know, I work in Mexico City. There's certain threads of design futures. There's a Smithsonian exhibition that's being designed right now. Um, so it's gaining wider birth and traction in the world. I think as practitioners, uh, I think we're going to find, uh, you know, we have a kit of tools now. We have a process. I mean, this is something that, that Stuart and I, in a way, we're kind of uh, making up on our own and, and Jason Tester and uh, other people, Jermaine Cascio is a colleague of ours, was working and doing these kind of things. But a whole host of people were kind of more or less inventing, I'm, again, generalizing, with the, inventing these tools. And I think we've gotten to a point where we can, we've systematized it, where if it's not foolproof, at least there's a process and that, that it's communicatab communicatable. You don't, there's not some sort of special genius sauce that you have to have to do this. And I think everyone can get better at foresight. And I think everyone that wants to get better at doing um, experiential and design futures can use these tools now and bet it. So I'm, I'm, I'm leading up to say that, it, again, it's at different scales. We may see large museum public versions of this. We, in this election cycle, we may see instead of uh, you know uh, ads about the present, more about visions of the future, right? I mean, that's what all, all campaigns are, is trying to sell a vision of the future. So I think we're gonna see a lot of that in the near term. But also, I mean, Toshi, you know this, augmented and, and virtual reality, overlaying possible futures, looking at simulations that, that could appear before us in, in real space, you know, that we can proprioceptively feel and, and look around. So overlaying possible futures, designing those, um, interacting with those, um, mathematical and, and visual simulations that are gonna happen. 
Uh, you know, so I, I, I think those are the, the areas. So not only just growth in general and then more people speaking this language and doing this work, but also the, the kind of media that we're going to be utilizing. Simulation, virtual reality, augmented reality. Um, and then I'll, I'll make a pitch for one of my pet ideas for a long time, which is basically a simulation core that we have a, that we institute a draft to have people come and pre live possible futures so that we can have a feedback loop back into our current decision making processes. So, um, you know, that's a little bit of a, <laughs> a leap into the future, but I think, I think we're going to, we're learning because the stakes are still extremely high that if we can see and feel these possible futures uh, ahead of time, um, again, that, that learning process, which we always have to do in those feedback loops can be cheaper, less painful, um, and more effective if we embed these tools into our standard processes. So I see a, a bright future for it and, and a tip of the spear where there's a lot of exper experimentation possibilities ongoing. Jock, uh, any quick last thoughts? We've we're just in our last minute here. I think the future, uh, the future of design futures, um, it has a lot to do with involving more people doing kind of massive futures, massive scenarios to larger audiences like a community, like um, if you go, um, instead of asking people what they think about the future, make them prototype of visions and versions of, of uh, alternative futures and make them live these futures. So a, an impoverished community, um, a university, um, a, 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 sit, a town hall or a, um, um, I don't know, um, some students, what are, what are, what could be, they could live in a future in which X type of education exists and, and then help them uh, redesign the system. I, th I think that's the, one of the possible futures for design futures doing that. Type so of you can take a engagement. class with us. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to just share up. We're yeah. at, we're at time here. I'm going to share up our um, emails here. Um, you're, if you'd like to get in touch with any of us and continue this conversation, I can already see from the Q and A, there's a lot of really interesting uh, uh, conversations to be had in this area. We encourage you to sign up for our course in April, where if you're interested in us bringing this course to your organization, reach out to us also. Um, we're, this is an area that well, all of us, myself included, are very excited to be building out, not just at IFTF, but in the world. So thank you to our um, our guests here today, Jacques and Jake, and thank you all for joining us. This is a really wonderful gathering, and please uh, sign up for futures, um, future foresight talks, and this talk will be available in one week, also online, archive version. Thank you, everyone, and uh, see you in the future. Aloha. All right.